Thank you for your presence this morning, for the worship, and uh, <clears throat> invite your attention to Matthew chapter 5. We're uh, tackling a new beatitude. Uh, it's the seventh, no, the sixth, no, the seventh. Anyhow, it's verse 8. I'm the one that's preaching too, aren't I? I should know these things. <laughs> I uh, wanted to uh, say to you that uh, I'm a seeker after the heart of God. I'm not a casual seeker. I'm not a once-in-a-while seeker. I am a desperate, got to have, can't stand it, hungering, thirsting, pushed, uh, fight for, go after, won't quit, seeker after the heart of God. Um, if he needs to embarrass me to get that done, Embarrassment it shall be. I don't want pride, uh, position, uh, anything to stand in the way of intimacy with him. Um, I give you permission to seek. It's okay to seek. It's right to seek. If you come to the Saturday night uh, supper at 5 o'clock and you don't eat, we look at you and say, you're not eating? What's wrong with you? I mean, nobody looks at you strangely and thinks it's strange for you to eat. You come to supper, you eat. We expect that. If you don't eat, that's strange. So it is with Jesus. If you're not seeking, what? You're not eating? What's your problem? So coming to the altar and seeking is not, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? If you don't come, we say, what's your problem? It's okay to seek. I realize we only got so much space, so we have decided to go all out, and we're changing the name of the furniture in the sanctuary. You're not sitting on a chair. You are sitting on an altar. You can stand to your feet and kneel where you are and turn your chair into an altar. We give you the right and the permission to seek. It's okay here. It's okay. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to begin at verse 3, and uh, I don't know if you'll be able to follow this, but I want you to uh, listen to it out of the Amplified New Testament. Blessed, happy, to be envied and spiritually prosperous, that is, with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of their outward circumstances, are the poor in spirit. The humble, rating themselves insignificant, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed and enviable, happy, with a happiness produced by experience of God's favor and especially conditioned by the revelation of his matchless grace are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed, happy, Joyous, spiritually prosperous, that is, with life joy and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of their outward circumstances, are the meek, the mild, patient, long-suffering, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed and fortunate and happy and spiritually prosperous, that is, in the state in which the born-again child of God enjoys his favor and salvation are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, uprightness, and right standing with God, for they shall be completely satisfied. Blessed, happy, to be envied, and spiritually prosperous, that is, with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of their outward circumstances, are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed, happy, fortunate, and spiritually prosperous, that is, possessing the happiness produced by the experience of God's favor and especially preconditioned and especially conditioned by the revelation of His grace, regardless of their outward conditions, are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Jesus, we want to see you. We would be content if in the next few moments 
We wouldn't say anything. We don't have to say anything. It's not about preaching. This is about seeing you. So whatever causes us to see you, let it be in this moment. Do your own speaking. Permeate our lives. Bring revelation. Let it take place, we pray thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're dealing with uh, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I want to give you a contrast. Start out with a contrast over here on this side. I want to give you the picture of the worldview. A uh, whole pagan society, uh, thousands and thousands, variety of gods, uh, whole philosophies and whole, uh, whole realms of uh, theology, uh, whole patterns. But all of this over here in a worldview is based upon the premise of honor and justice. The focus of everything in the worldview, the focus of everything in the pagan society was about honor and justice. The heart core of everything that they believed and everything they wanted to get done, and for the best part of them, was this idea of honor and justice. Purity had no place in their philosophy. For instance, if uh, my daughter was molested, it was not a matter of immorality. It was not, not, not a matter of somebody sinned and they need to be forgiven. It's not a matter of purity. It was not a matter of morality. It was a matter of honor. My honor. Someone had walked into my territory. Somebody had dishonored my family. Somebody had come into my territory. And the only way to reestablish my honor was to vindicate vengeance. I could go and murder the individual who did that and feel quite justified because now my honor would be reestablished and justice would be done. And I could wipe my hands. Didn't have anything to do with sin. Didn't have anything to do with morality. Didn't have anything to do with holiness. Didn't have anything to do with purity. It had to do with honor and justice. Worldview. The Romans, as we said several Sundays ago, had four cardinal virtues. One was wisdom, second was justice, third was temperance, and fourth was courage. There was no position, no purity in any of their concept. They did not have a view of purity. Worldview, honor, and justice. Now over here is a whole Jewish world. It's small. Minority group of people in a small section of country. They had a weird thing going because they had one God. This one God was Jehovah. He had an entirely different viewpoint that literally pressed upon all of this nation. And they had a focus. And it wasn't honor and justice. Their focus was purity, holiness. In fact, their God kept talking to them about this. And there was this, these prophets that kept Rising up saying, oh, don't you understand what's happening? It's because you lack purity. It's because you've sinned that, that you have walked away from God, that God has turned his back on you. Don't you understand that the separation between you and God is not because of honor and justice. It has to do with purity. It's you've disobeyed. Don't you understand? This is an issue of purity and holiness in fact their god came and in leviticus chapter 11 verse 44 said stuff like this for i am the lord your god you shall therefore consecrate yourself and you shall be holy for i am holy and everything i'm going to do in relationship to your life everything i'm going to do in in in, in relationship to, to your activities all the laws i'm going to give you all the sacrifices i'm going to establish are all going to be based on one thing oh I want holiness, purity for you. That's the driving passion of my heart. And God had a viewpoint and gave it to his people. And it was purity. Well, doesn't God want justice? Yes, God is a just God. But you understand, you have to see the justice through the eyes of the pure focus, the purity focus. Well, doesn't God believe in honor? Yes, but wait a minute. That honor has to be seen through the purity of the heart of God. So justice and honors takes on an entirely different perspective due to the heart of God, which is pure. 
So the whole driving force of Jehovah and, and Jewish, the Jewish view is this, is, this, is this passion for purity because God is a holy God. Worldview, honor, justice. Jewish view, purity focus. Now, push away the worldview and p- replace this side with Jesus' view. Isn't it interesting? Jesus was a Jew, so his focus was purity. Okay. Jesus came from the heart of God, so his focus is purity. Okay. So the big deal is about sin and holiness and purity. Okay. The Jews had that. I know. Jesus had that. I know. But Jesus said, oh, it's a new covenant. Your view is in the old covenant. God's over there. I'm over here. And your view of holiness and your view of purity is about external, outside stuff. I want to take this idea of purity, which is the heart of God, and I want to take it, Jesus said, to a whole new level. I want to internalize it. And I want to talk to you about purity of heart. Not purity of activities, although that'll come. Not purity of duties, although that'll be there. Not purity of performance, although certainly that will be manifested. But purity of heart, that the focus will not be on external accomplishment. The focus will be on internal reality, state of existence in the internal of your heart. Uh, We talked about this uh, Thursday night in the class. So interesting. Because the Jews were so wrapped up, they they had taken the laws of God and they had developed 613 oral interpretations of that law. And you have to interpret, I mean, apply, you understand. God has a law, oh, what does that mean? Well, I don't know. It was written way back where, but way back in the past. They didn't have televisions, they didn't have computers, they didn't have iPhones, come on. So we've got to take that law and apply it in our generation. Well, sure, we have to do that. So when you do that, you take this law of God and say, what does that mean today in my lifestyle? So you make rules Spring off of his rules. You have to do that. They did that. 613 of them, to be sure. And the idea was, this is the law of God, which would give us purity. And now we got 613 oral interpretations of that law, which will make us pure. They are oral interpretations because we're not going to write them down. We're going to say them so often, you'll memorize them. Thus, we're just going to speak them all the time. Because we're really going to be focused on these activities. And the whole focus of the sixteen hundred uh, uh, of the six hundred and thirteen oral interpretations was purity, but the purity was all external. We gave the illustration of Matthew chapter fifteen. The Jews came from Jerusalem, came all the way up from Jerusalem, eighty to hundred miles. The, the leaders, Pharisees, scribes, came all the way up to get at Jesus. What were they all upset about? Your disciples don't wash their hands before they eat. It's not a matter of purity in terms of germs. It was a matter of cleanliness in term purity in terms of defilement. See, there's these Gentiles. You know who a Gentile is? Anybody who isn't a Jew. <gasps> you must be a Gentile. They affectionately called us Gentile dogs. Dogs are dirty. A Gentile walks down the street. When he walks down the street, he stirs up dust. Oh, no. Now the dust is defiled from the Gentile who's dirty. The wind picks up the dust, blows it over, and gets it on you, the Jew. Oh, no, it's on me. I'm defiled. Yeah, because the dust is defiled because the Jew, the Gentile, is dirty. Now that my hands are defiled, I reach out and grab a hold of a glass. Oh, no, the glass is defiled. Why? Because the hand is defiled. Why? Because it touched the dust that was defiled. Why? Because it came from the Gentile who's dirty. I drink the liquid inside the glass is now defiled. Why? Because the glass is defiled. Why? Because the hand is defiled. Why? Because the dust is defiled. Why? Because it came from that 
dirty Gentile. Now I drink it. Oh, I'm defiled <gasps> inside. Why? Because what I drank was defiled because the glass was defiled because the hand was defiled because the dust was defiled because, oh, no, that dirty Gentile. There's only one kind of way to compensate for that and to be pure, and that is to go through the defilement, the opposite of defilement, which is cleansing. So you wash your hands. It's a ceremonial thing. You take water, pour it from here down, from here down. You turn it over from here down. You do that several times, several times. Ooh, now, oh, I am purified. I'm pure. All outside. Now, if you think that's ridiculous, I should tell you about some of our rules. <laughs> All outside. Jesus in that situation, oh, you'll have to search it out yourself, don't have time, but it was, it was strong. Finally, after he nailed those boys and they went away, he turned to his disciples and he said, Mammoth statements. Statements like Matthew 15, 11. Statements like not what goes into the mouth defiles a man. But what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. What? Yeah, it is what you put in your mouth. No. It's what comes out of your mouth. Why? Because what comes out of your mouth comes out of your heart. And that's where purity or impurity is found. In the heart. So Jesus took this whole deal to a whole deeper level. He began to talk about purity within. We're beginning a study on this beatitude. There's going to be three of them. Three of them. Sight of purity, statement of purity, significance of purity. We're dealing with the first one this morning. The sight of purity. What is the location of purity? Where is it to be located? You already know the answers. It's in the Beatitude. Blessed are the pure in heart. You remember that the word blessed is the idea of congratulations, makarios. It's congratulation. It's an adjective in, nominative, in the nominative case, which means it literally modifies, addresses the subject itself. So it modifies the subject. The word the, blessed, by the way, the word are isn't there. Blessed, the, pure, the, is the subject in the Greek language. It's the subject of the whole sentence. It can be translated this one or that one, so the subject is actually the. Well, what does that mean? I don't know, except that it's the, this one, that one, that's being congratulated. So it's an adjective modifying the subject. So congratulations, this one. Well, who is this one? Ah, pure in the verse. Pure. Cartharos. Purity is an adjective in the nominative case, which means it modifies the subject. So it's congratulations, pure, the, the, this one, that one. In other words, the one who is pure and congratulated is the subject. The subject is pure and the subject is being congratulated. He's blessed beyond degree. Then comes the word, the heart. Cardia, it's the Greek word. It's where we get our word cardiac. Cardia. Cardia. It's in the dative case, which is equal to the direct object. So this whole congratulation, pure state that you are in, all is focused in a location. And the location is your heart. So he's not congratulating the pure of hands. He's not congratulating the ones who think pure. He's not congratulating the ones who have no vile deeds in their life. He's not congratulating all the law keepers. He's not congratulating everyone who took a shower this morning. Please do. It's not that. He's congratulating the individual who is absolutely 
pure, pure, holy in his heart. Now, Jesus is going to go after that strongly in the Sermon on the Mount. And he's always going to press holiness. He's always going to press purity into the location of the heart. He's never going to talk about it in any other state except it's going to be in the inner heart and it's going to flow out of the heart. In fact, right here in chapter 5, as you go on in the Sermon on the Mount, he begins this whole parallel of, you have heard it said by them of old, I say to you, you've heard it said by them of old, thou shalt not murder, be pure in your outward activity, don't kill anybody. He says, I tell you, don't hate purity within. For most of us, the hardest one of all is the one he gave in Matthew chapter 5, 28. You've heard it said by them of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks on a woman to lust for her has committed, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Who could live up to that? Only the one with a pure heart. Now I can conceive how a guy would control his mind. Slap his hand. Have a wife that would kill him. So he behaves himself. I can conceive of that. <laughs> See, that makes sense to me. But to push it to a whole different what? Where it's inside you? And you're right within? Pure within? He's going to push it further. He's going to take you to Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. And as all of this progresses, he's going to be talking about treasures. Oh, and he's going to talk about treasure on earth, and he's going to talk about treasure in heaven. And what's the focus of that all about? Well, treasure on earth, obviously, is for my personal benefit. Now, treasure in heaven has a focus upon what goes beyond, what's more important, what's, what goes beyond this life, what goes beyond the temporal, what I can see. I buy the new car. Oh, it's not a new car anymore. Good night. In fact, it's not a, it's all, it doesn't run anymore. Well, what happened to that? Oh, he says you focus on that. That's treasure on earth let me folk let me give you a focus on that which will last forever oh then he ends it up by saying this verse for where your treasure is there your heart oh. what what's that all about where your treasure is there your heart will be also that it's not about treasure at all it's about what heart focus because that's the driving factor of your life. See, in the whole tabernacle scene and temple scene, there were all these places you couldn't go. Why? Too sacred. Too sacred. See, you couldn't go into the Holy of Holies. Oh, only a high priest once in a while, once a year. And he could only go in there through proper preparation. And it was, oh, strenuous. The writer of the Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 22 says, Draw near with a true heart. <laughs> In full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And he goes on to say, Hey, because we have a pure heart, and while we have been sprinkled, our hearts have been sprinkled from an evil, evil conscience, we can just stop in any place. <laughs> It's the access card. I'm in. Why? Pure heart. That the pure heart opens every door God wants for you. Purity in the heart. Paul was writing to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.22, and his advice for this young man was, Flee! Flee! Flee also youthful lust. Pursue, pursue, pursue 
righteousness. Faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. I want to give you three ideas. Walk through this with me. If purity is located in the heart, why is it located in the heart? What's the significance of that? Number one, the heart is defined as the center of man. So when we're talking about heart, obviously we're not talking about the blood pumper. And in biblical context, when you're talking about the heart, you're talking about the seat of the desires the feelings, the affections, the passions, and the impulses of your inner being. So this is really a key area. The whole blood system sacrifice was set up on this. God gave us a verse that we quote quite often, Leviticus 17, 11, and said, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Why is that? Life is in the blood, and it's the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Why is that? Because the concept was not about blood. The concept was about life, and life is in the blood. And since it comes out of the heart and comes back to the heart, obviously the very source, the very pump, the very spring, the very essence of what makes you live, where you come from, it would be in our language, what makes you tick? That's. Whatever that is that makes you tick, that's the heart. That somehow this, what he's talking about in the heart concept, the location of purity is that all the aspects of your life, how could you picture them? All the aspects of your life are overlapping. You've got your mind, you've got your emotions, you've got your nerves, you've you've got your will, they're all overlapping. And at the point where they overlap, Oh, right there. The point of all of those come together, touch and overlap. Right there, right there. That's your heart. See, your mind comes under the control of your heart. See, your emotions are dictated by your heart. See, your, 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 your will is going to be determined. What you decide and what you don't decide is going to be determined by the heart. See, it isn't the heart is over here and the mind is over here. No, the mind and the heart, they all interlap, interlap and where they interlap, right, overlap is right there, right there, right there. That's the heart. And that determines nerves, that determines depression, that determines thought process, that determines decision, that determines that. The heart, the heart literally controls. It's a merging of all of those. Wow. It's the whole person. In fact, when God, Deuteronomy 4.29, wanted to tell us this, he said, but from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart (laughs) and with all your soul. That is, your whole entire being, the whole man. My mind, my will, my emotions, my desires, my everything about me, all focused on and after and seeking him. My whole being. The heart. Jesse, the father of David, had several sons. And, uh, of course, Samuel was supposed to get a, uh, was supposed to go select a king. And God told him to go to Samuel and pick out one of the boys. So he went down there, and here's all the boys. Oh, tall, strong, some of them really. Oh, and Samuel looks at, oh, he'd be a good one. He he looks like he could lead. And God got him aside and said this in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical structure because I have, oh, this is so encouraging, isn't it? Don't look at the physical structure. Don't look at his appearance or his physical statue because I have refused him for the Lord does not see as man sees for man looks at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart. (laughs) He's looking at your heart. He's looking at your heart. It's interesting when they were choosing uh, 
a new apostle to take the place of Judas, they prayed before they chose. And in Acts 2.14, they prayed this and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all. It literally is the Greek word heart knower. (laughs) That's where God goes. It's the center point of man's existence. It's the human personality. It's the thinking. It's the remembering. It's the feeling. It's the desiring. It's the willing. It's where they all overlap. It's right at the very core of your being. Isn't it interesting that God reports that Pharaoh's heart, heart was hardened. Jesus was born, Luke 2, 19. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Center point of existence. We were made in the image of God. We've all heard that. That's been pounded at us, and we all believe that. Made in the image of God. That means there are qualities that you have that God has. What is it that I have that God has? Listen to Hosea chapter 11, verse 8 and 9. My, God said, my heart churns. Get this. My heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. I will not execute the fierceness of my wrath. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and no man. The Holy One is in your midst. I will not come with terror. He says, my emotions are running wild. I want to smash you. My my anxiety is high. My my nerves are on edge. But listen, all of that's coming under the control of my heart. My heart. My heart. And my anger will come under the control of my heart. And my emotions will bow to my heart. And here's what I am in my heart. And this is what I'm expressing to you. The center point of existence. I was just blown away by this verse in uh, Titus 1.15. Paul is writing to Titus and he's saying, he's talking to him about the core of existence. And he says, to the pure, all things are pure. What? But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Well, now listen, I may not be all I ought to be, but but hey, I do have some good. No, you don't. If you're not right inside, nothing about your life is good. Even your good is bad. Why? Because it comes from a heart that's defiled. And if you're pure, everything is pure. Why? Because everything is produced by the, wow, what a wild concept. That this is not, I do this, this is pure, but I do this and this is impure. That's, no, everything is brought under the control of the heart and is judged by what's going on in my heart, which is the reason for it. Oh, I got to have a pure heart because the heart is the center point of life. Number two, got to hurry. The heart is the dwelling place of God. Well, you expected that. Come on. If purity is located in the heart and the heart is the center point of man's existence where the mind, the will, the emotion, the desires, the the nerves, everything overlaps and right there, right there where they all overlap, the heart is there and what's in the heart controls all of it. If that's the center point of man's life, where would God want to (laughs) dwell? In that spot. Well, sure. In that spot. The tabernacle temple scene, phenomenal. Uh, You can get pictures of it and study it for yourself, but you got this outer court, court of the Gentiles, and there's a wall along in there where if a Gentile goes past that, he's stoned to death. He can't go past that place. And uh, then there's a place for the women, place for the men, and then there's the, and that. But when you go to the core, you got the holy place and the holy of holies. Oh. It's where God dwells, the heart of the temple, where God dwells. Don't you know 1 Corinthians 3.16? Do you not know you are the temple of God 
and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Where? My left toe? No, the heart. The center point of your life. Wow. We quote that scripture often about, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the power may be of God and not of us. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. We all know that verse. But the verse before that, we don't seem to remember that one. It says, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness and has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of, of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Did you get it? It is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts. He says, do you know what was going on in the face of Jesus? That was coming from the insides of Jesus shining out of his face. Do you realize God has taken that and he's given that same light that was in the heart of Jesus in us? That's the treasure. That's the treasure he's planted in us. So everything that was going on in the inner heart of Jesus was shining shining out of his face is the same thing that's now been planted in you. Can I see it on your face? Galatians 4, 6. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Well, how do you know you're a child of God? Well, because you come to church and you do what? No. The reason you know you're a child of God is because God has taken his spirit and put it at the very center core of your life where all of these things, the mind, the will, the emotions, the desires, all of them overlap and God has planted his spirit right there in the inner core of your being. And you know what he's doing there? He's constantly crying out, Abba, Father. Telling you, you're a child. I can't talk you out of that. I can't talk you into that. <laughs> That's the reality of his indwelling you. Paul prayed in Ephesians 3, 7, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Now, the opposite of all of this is true because if Christ doesn't dwell in your hearts, what does dwell in your heart? Hebrews 3, 2, 12. Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you, be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God. Romans 1, 24. It's the pagans. Wrath of God is against all the ungodliness. What was the wrath of God? He let them go. And it says, verse 24, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to destroy their bodies among themselves. All sexual perversion comes from where? Well, I was born that way. No, you weren't. Comes from a heart. Comes from a heart. Comes from the heart. See, folks, if the heart is the location of purity, and the heart is the center point where all of these aspects of my life interlock, overlap. And that's the heart. And God wants to dwell there. That's not superficial. That's not an external activity. That's not an addition to. That's not add on something. That's not a garment you put on. That's not Jesus as my business partner. That's not Jesus a counselor who's giving me advice. That's not Jesus the instructor who's teaching me. That would be a lover of my very inner being who embraces me here in my heart. Number three. The heart is the center point of man's existence. The heart is the dwelling place of God. The heart is the determining 
factor of salvation. Am I saved or am I not saved? I don't know. Look at your heart. Not look at your activities. Look at your heart. Not see yourself on your best days. Look at your heart. Salvation is determined by the heart. Let's go back to the big commandment. Deuteronomy 6, 5. You shall, which is quoted in Matthew twenty two thirty seven. 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind. Don't look at the educational level. Don't look at. Look at the heart. Salvation is contained exclusively in the heart. I want you to walk through me in closing with this. I want you to walk through this quote. It's long. You have to concentrate. Here it is. You know this. The heart is every man's best part. The shrine of his affections. The ocean of his thoughts the storehouse of the energies of his will. Did you get it? Think about it. The heart is every man's best part. The shrine of his affections. The ocean of his thoughts. The storehouse of the energies of his will. Insomuch that there is not one of the mollifarious responsibilities of life he can worthily bear nor one of its great duties that he can effectually discharge until he has learned to put his heart into it. A kid comes to class, sits on the back row, nods off, texts. Why doesn't he learn anything? Doesn't put his heart in it. Duh. The kid's not stupid, but you can't teach him. Why? Doesn't put his heart into it. He isn't interested. His heart doesn't burn for what the, what the instructor is teaching. He isn't into that. It's a heart matter. How do you take the kid and get his heart into it? How do you boost him into that? How do you, you can say, oh, you can't play ball if you don't get an A. That motivates him a little, but come on, his, his heart isn't in it. That won't take him to college. That won't teach him anything. He won't, how do you? It's a matter of the heart, man. You come to church, you keep looking at your watch. You don't participate in worship. You come when you feel like it. What's the problem? Aren't I nice looking? Don't I yell out enough? What's the problem? Oh, it's your heart. We're trying to get your heart into this. And we can put on all kinds of programs. Woo! We can do the song and dance. Woo! We can give away the, we can have the free suppers. Woo! But if you don't get into this with your heart, if Jesus doesn't capture your heart, it's a heart matter. Look at it. The heart is every man's best part. The shrine of his affections, the ocean of his thoughts, the storehouse of the energies of his will, insomuch that there is not one of the mollifarious responsibilities of life which he can worthily bear, nor one of the duties that he can effectually discharge until he has learned to put his heart into it. Least of all, oh, get this, least of all, it is, is it possible for religion to be of value unless it be suffused with the tenderness, glowing with the ardor, and resolute with the purpose of the heart. As we ourselves know, 
if we have never won a man, we have never won a man until we have gained his affection. So he who created and redeems us insists that we give him nothing to him until we have given nothing to him until we yield our love. Consent of the intellect atones for nothing. Conviction of the judgment alone is nothing. Service of the hand alone is nothing. His grave, sweet voice still calls to us out of heaven. My son, give me your heart. And only when this is done can we be counted among his disciples. The seat of his religion is the heart its effect is to produce purity of the heart. Its reward is to open the eyes of the mind. Oh, Jesus. The issue today is not, will I stop that? Will I never do that again? Will I give up that activity? This is not about the surrender of things. This is about my heart. Will I put my heart into it? Will I give you my heart? The center point of my life where you want to dwell. Will I let you capture My heart. And if I will not let you capture my heart, am I not? Every religion of the world. More duty. More performance. Doing enough to get by. But what about my heart? Jesus, I want purity in my heart. I want you, the holy God, dwelling where all the aspects of my life overlap so that my mind is controlled by your presence and my will is dictated by your desires and my emotions come under your auspices for you dwell in my heart. Heads are bowed. Oh, it's an old appeal. Jesus stands at your heart's door, knocking. The devil would get you distracted with all sorts of other issues. But the core issue is purity in the location of the heart. Come on, man. Does he have your heart? Do you burn for him in your heart? Is he the lover of your heart? Have you been captured by Jesus Oh, in your heart. You're just looking for solutions. You're just looking for ways out. Solve your problems. Where have you and Jesus got together? In your heart. Does he have your affection? Ah, uh, no embarrassment today. I'm a seeker. Whoo, I am a seeker. 
Jesus break down all the barriers, all the cumbersome things I've drug around the door of my heart. God, go through the closets of my heart. Purify, cleanse all the garbage, all the junk, all the residue of days gone by. Purify, purify. In the name of Jesus, purify. Purify my heart. No task I do, no effort I make, no accomplishment I achieve will get that done. You must come. into my heart Lord Jesus come into my heart today come in today come in to stay oh come into my heart my heart Lord Jesus ah, I want to seek with me be obedient 